EML 524, assignment number one. In this presentation, I'm going to briefly discuss my professional and personal development as an EFL teacher. First, I would like to briefly discuss my own experiences as a language learner, then my professional experiences teaching English in China. Next, I'll outline uh, my own understanding of important language teaching theories and principles. And finally, I'll sketch out my own vision for language learning. Part 1. My experiences as a language learner. My first experience learning a second language came in middle school when I studied French. I did fine, but not amazing. The reason being I had no real motivation besides getting the credits. Now that I'm a language teacher, finding ways to engage students is a top priority for me. I really don't want them to sit in a classroom and feel the way I felt when I was studying French. My next stab at a foreign language was my junior year of college when I was studying abroad one year in Istanbul. While I was there, I took uh, Turkish courses offered to all the exchange students. But like French, uh, I didn't really have long-term needs for the language and therefore I didn't really have the motivation to commit it to knowledge. Years later, when I found out I'd be moving to Guangzhou for my first EFL job, I started watching YouTube videos on Chinese and tried to write out characters by myself. I even found some cool Chinese rock and roll to listen to, because I decided that I wasn't going to rely on anyone for assistance while I lived there. I wanted to do things by myself, or at least I was going to try to do that as soon as possible. I think that language, uh, or I think that learning the language that my students speak at the same time that they're learning mine is probably the single most important thing I've done to improve my own teaching abilities. Not only do I understand why they make the mistakes they make in terms of grammar and pronunciation, but it's also helped me to understand their cultural background as well. Also, finding a reason to learn Chinese gave me a perspective into figuring out how to give students that motivation for English, even though I'm still working on this today. Part two, my professional work experience in China. The first job I got in Guangzhou was at a language center called Organic English Education. It was run by two young men from the UK and classes were taught by a mixture of native speaking foreigners and local Chinese teachers. The center was laid out so that, that there was lots of natural light and these big, full, all-glass, cubicle-style classrooms. The center of the center was a series of long tables where students and teachers who were not actively in a class could hang out and have free talk. The students were mostly university students planning to go abroad and also young professionals looking to improve their conversational English. It became very apparent quickly that the students who were outgoing, extroverted, open to new ideas and experiences all did very well at this center. And I saw some of the most dramatic progress I've ever seen in a one-year span at that school. On the other hand, shy or introverted students, especially beginners and older students, really struggled to advance at all. Instruction to the students uh, L1, Chinese, at this center was forbidden, even by the Chinese teachers. But for students with almost no English, I think that some L1 use is very important. There were several different sorts of TESOL professionals that I met at Organic. The owners, Peter and Jeff, and the local Chinese teachers, and also the other foreign teachers. I remember when I first toured around the center the day of my interview, Peter explained to me that the reason for the floor-to-ceiling glass cubicle classroom setup was to, quote, let the learning flow organically through the space. This, I later found out, I guess, was supposed to be like a metaphor for the communicative approach to learning that they sought. I think that the biggest impact that Peter and Jeff had on me, unfortunately, in the long run was my belief that the no L1 method is really problematic for beginning students. I kept thinking to myself, this doesn't make sense. They're, not going to, they're just going to give up. Um, and there is a vast quantity of research that has shown that uh, well-planned use of L1 in the classroom has many benefits for students, especially beginners. 
But this no L1 paradigm has reared its head one way or another over and over since I've moved to China. The next job I got in China was at a language center called Scholastic. Young students learn English from beginning with ABC phonics along with simple words and phrases before learning to put phonics together into words and sentences. The young children's classes use an interactive whiteboard program, which is pretty standard in China. There's a strong audiolingual element to the classes, repetition of key words and key phrases, and in the behavioralist tradition, especially at the lower levels, the meanings of the sentences are not nearly as important as familiarizing students with the new language. Uh, one of the classes that I still teach today, which is for much older students and much more advanced students, um, is really excellent, and I'd like to look at it for one second. I've been teaching these students for a long time, and since I've been able to work with both the parents and the school's management to tweak the classroom environment and materials, uh, while it is a work in progress and far from perfect, I'm quite happy with the overall environment um, and the student's progress. Just for example, we'll usually start each class with some speaking time. Uh, I'll usually prepare questions related to the reading comprehension that we have that week. So for a passage like this, I might write out the following questions. Does anyone know what a carnivore is? What kind of animals are carnivores? Or do you know any other carnivores? Um, how do they hunt for their food, etc.? And I like to ask follow-up questions based on their answers. And, and a lot of the time, students like to you know, argue or you know, piggyback off of each other's ideas. And I think that's great. And it's a really natural way for them to communicate and sort of improve their communication skills. And I usually don't correct grammar at this time unless it interferes with you know, basic comprehension. Uh, afterwards, the students will read the paragraph and will explain the key vocabulary. And we don't use the students L1 in class unless, again, it makes sense to save time and be efficient. We also have a writing textbook. And I think writing is an important piece at this center because the students don't get much help with composition in English classes, especially not in their Chinese classes either. Uh, so the book I use focuses on vocabulary, grammar, paragraphs, and essays. If we look at Nation and McAllister's environmental analysis model, I found that this class is one of the most environmentally excellent that I think I've ever had. Long class times, small class size, a high degree of parent support. And this is one of the reasons that I've kept this class even part-time. It was at Scholastic that I met probably the most important TESOL professional I've known in China, uh, the owner of the center, Evelyn. Uh, she's really helped me to not only grow as a teacher, but to understand the deeper social context of what it means to teach in China. The obsession with the native speaker paradigm, the monolingual paradigm, etc. And as my students have gotten older, we've developed more of a collaborative relationship in terms of planning classes that no one had actually taught before. Another important series of interactions at Scholastic wasn't actually with official TESOL professionals, but instead actually with many of the parents of my advanced students. A lot of these families are employed at the nearby Sun Yat-sen University, which is one of the most prestigious in China, and therefore the families are highly educated. And not only are they highly educated, they are deeply invested in their children's education and have very strong views about it. This has led to many, many important conversations about how the classroom should operate, which books are worth reading, which aren't. What did I read when I was a kid? Which books had the greatest impact on me? Which do I think are overrated? We discussed how much focus should be given to writing, which types of writing, and how it should be taught. I've always been a big proponent of speech and debate, as well as persuasive writing as an important analytical skill. This is not commonly taught in China. And after some discussions, we started a small debate team. So these are some of the most meaningful and insightful relationships that I've made in China. In my current full-time position at Guangzhou Medical University, I couldn't dream of such open conditions. Some classroom environments are better than others, but a quick environmental analysis of my typical oral or reading class would yield the following constraints. First, 
the motivation to be active in class and engage in English is inconsistent. Some students are very interested, while many simply need the credit. Many of these students will, will be medical professionals in China, and so maybe they need to engage in English language academic writing, but oral English is certainly not a priority. Second, at 80 minutes with around 40 students, the class is by no means huge, but it is difficult to interact with all the students in the allotted time. Furthermore, given the huge student body, I only see these students once or twice a month, so it's almost impossible to really build relationships. Three, the classroom setup is a big computer lab style room. Desks cannot be rearranged, and if the students don't want to engage, it's easy for them to sort of duck behind the computer screen. Another constraint is cultural. Traditionally in China, the teacher is a lecturer, and students listen but do not ask questions. When I'm teaching medical terminology, this is not really an issue, but when I'm instructed to engage with the students on reading assignments or teach oral English. It is frustrating when zero to maybe one or two students volunteer to speak. One technique I've used is to actually use a random number generator to select speakers, which does often snowball into more participation. It's sort of like no one wants to be the first one. And considering that I'm a new employee at the university and a foreigner, I feel like that I have very little leverage to alter any of these factors. Luckily, I have had the opportunity to design my own oral English elective course. In this course, which meets weekly and also has about 45 students, give or take, the department has told me that the goal of the course was to give students who want to study abroad a chance to improve their oral English and also their cultural understanding. And I was instructed to design the class from an American perspective, because that's my background, even though there's a high chance that many of the students will never actually study in the US specifically. But then again, I don't know much about Australian culture either, and anything I taught would probably be phony or misleading to anyone who ever went to that country. So the course is split between lecture and specific topic and group work where the students can create their own short oral presentations. But of course, there are still some constraints. Um, for example, time and the fact that the class only meets once per week. But again, it's a work in progress. It's the first year that I've designed this course. So I think in the coming year, I might trim back some of the lecture and allow more time for student interaction and participation. I've been working with the English department to sort of figure out the most streamlined and effective way to teach this course. Part three, language theories and principles. Grammar translation method, or GTM. GTM is often called the classical method of language teaching in that it is the oldest of all modern methods and it was originally used to teach dead languages like Latin or ancient Greek. Uh, students will learn the rules of grammar, lexicon, and cultural context by translating texts from authors of that language. GTM still exists in a lot of classrooms today, uh, particularly in the explanations of grammar, and particularly when those explanations are done in the student's L1. Um, in an example from Saudi Arabia, Asalahi explains a process which I've seen in many Chinese classrooms and one which I believe is common worldwide. He says, the lesson usually starts with illustrations of rules on the board, uh, the use of colors, explanations of the rules, and the use of Arabic language, understanding action by students, recognition of substitution drills, repetition drills, and repetition of chunks of language. The main reason for the popularity of this method is that grammar is complex and hard to understand, especially when being explained in a language that is already unfamiliar. Teachers often have time constraints and feel that they have no choice but to explain grammar in such a way. Teaching using only old texts or relying heavily on the L1 are certainly not excellent ways to prepare learning learners to be active, autonomous language users. So in short, there are pros, uh, it is effective uh, for teachers to explain grammar. Students are more comfortable hearing these ideas in their L1. It doesn't require a lot of materials besides books and a blackboard. And of course, the cons are mainly it's very boring. 
It doesn't give students practice using the language. And a result, as a result, many students may get the false sense that they understand the language, but they don't really have any ability or practice to use it. Behavioralism. Behavioralism has its roots in behaviorist psychology. The most famous of these is probably Pavlov, whose dogs were trained to salivate at the ring of a bell. But other behavioralists, such as Watson and Skinner, provided the foundation for linguists to apply these principles in the classroom. One of the very common uh, uh, methods of behavioralism is called audiolingualism, which places key importance on pronunciation, particularly that which attempts to replicate that of native speakers. Methodologies that attempt to achieve this in the classrooms are much like the ones I saw in my French classroom in middle school, but also in scholastic and Guangzhou medical. Methodologies like listening to audio, watching videos, practicing pre-written dialogues. One of the most common methods that's grown out of audio legalism is PPP, that is presentation, practice, and production. First, the teacher presents the new concept, such as vocabulary or sentence structure. Then the students practice using these new language features in a controlled environment. And finally, students are given some task in which they will ideally create their own speech or writing that uses the new features in a more free and open way. Shintani suggests actually that we can move beyond PPP uh, and it can be improved by giving students of more real world tasks, what he calls task based learning. And communicative language teaching, or CLT. Whereas audio lingualism attempts to chase the dream of achieving a, as close to native speaker proficiency as possible, communicative language teaching acknowledges that there is no such thing as the ideal native speaker. The goal of CLT is not to develop a native speaker accent or a textbook understanding of grammar, but instead to dissolve, de develop what is called communicative competence. That is, uh, being able to communicate one's needs in a way that is appropriate in the situation. Lessons, therefore, should focus around real-world tasks and situations, uh, conversations, and role plays. Krashen's concept of the comprehensible out input is also very important. That is, input that students can understand, but that's just beyond their current level. Therefore, students continue to make slow but steady progress. Comprehensible input comes from not just the teacher, but also from the interactions between students uh, that they have with each other. CLT lessons may include listening comprehension exercises, followed by communication-based activities which engage the ideas presented in the listening. One of the biggest questions in CLT research is about grammar. Should it be taught directly in the classroom or will students pick it up through interaction and practice? Krashen and others felt that comprehensible input and practical use are enough so that students learn uh, will acquire grammar, meaning that they learn it without realizing that they're learning it, similar to the way that we learn our first languages. Part four, my vision for T TESOL. There's two parts to this. One is personal and one is global. My ideal TESOL classroom is based, as is popular, mostly around communicative language teaching. I found that students do tend to pick up on grammar and a more standard way of expressing themselves over time without being taught grammar explicitly. I saw this over the course of my year at Organic in the free talk area. <clears throat> I even noticed it myself studying Chinese. Rules that didn't make sense when someone explained them on the whiteboard slowly made their way into my understanding through repeated exposure and use. That being said, I still think it holds that elements of grammar translation and audio lingualism have their place in the classroom, but only as a support system for their communicative focus. For example, I've seen had a lot of lower level students who just couldn't understand the rules for, for example, subject and object pronouns in English. And just being able to explain that quickly to them on their own terms cleared up a lot of frustration and we were able to just move on. Also, I think that drilling sentences and idioms and vocabulary is very helpful for getting your mouth used to speaking in a new way. But I would prefer that students incorporate it into their solo studies outside of class. There's not really a need to do group dictations in a class when everyone's time is limited. 
I'm currently planning to transition from EFL in China back to ESL in the US in the coming years, and I would like to uh, set up, get settled in an area with a large Chinese population so that my experience with the language can be to my benefit. It seems like a person with TESOL experience and also Chinese experience is a valuable niche, but this is still just in the planning phases right now. As far as my vision for global TESOL is concerned, I think the most important thing is, uh, for the business as a whole, is the continual dissolving of this native speaker paradigm. As more and more people become English speakers, more and more will be competent instructors as well. Especially with events like COVID-19 disrupting the international relocation and travel, I've seen a lot of families here cancel their enrollment in Chinese language centers because of the lack of native speakers, rather than just have a local teacher teach them who's equally or more qualified. There is no standard English, and certain native dialects are just as strange to students uh, as those from other countries. So. I think it's important that we move beyond this really for a more integrated global world. These are just my general thoughts on uh, TESOL, my understanding of principles and theories, some history about myself as well. So thank you for listening and have a nice day.